Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Maplex Border Pulls Off Using a Total Joint Practice. My name is Anna Ornelas, and I'm the Associate Marketing Manager at Monica Healthcare Canada. Before we get started, please submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A box. You may submit your questions at any time. We will collect them and address them during the Q&A portion at the end. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Charlie Elson. Charlie graduated from the University of Iowa in 2014 with a master's in physician assisted studies. He has worked in orthopedics with prominent specialists since 2015, focusing on total hip and knee replacement, including many complex revisions. Thank you. Over to you, Charlie. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. And so first of all, thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I, I certainly understand how busy schedules can be professionally and personally. So again, thank you for joining me. And also thank you to Monlika for organizing this event, as well as spreading the word to get so many people out here today. Please bear with me. I'm just kind of getting over a little bit of a, an upper respiratory infection. So um, a little nasally, and hopefully I don't go into any coughing spells, but um, I think I can confidently say that most of us here are a part of the healthcare team, whether that's in orthopedics or general surgery, whether you're a physician, an APP, an RN, a scrub tech, something else. I know, I know there's many that I'm forgetting, but what we all have in common is that we all work in healthcare. Taking that a step further, I would venture to say that most of us here are competitive, compassionate, scientific, and stuck in our way of doing things, yet also open to change when necessary. I'd argue that those characteristics are present in most healthcare providers and are certainly good descriptors of me. I hate when we have surgical complications, from a devastating periprosthetic fracture to a simple wound infection. I lose sleep. I feel like I failed. I worry what effect it has on the patient, the time it costs them, the money it costs them, the physical and emotional stress I have now caused that person. And I think about ways to improve the process. A few years ago, we had to improve our process. We were having wound complications. And so we changed the way we did everything from the suture to the dressing. And during this process, we came across Mepilex border post-op dressing. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about its use in our total joint practice. Disclaimer, I am a paid consultant for Manlika, though I do not have any other disclosures. All right, so we're gonna to try to get a little bit of audience participation here. So if you have the chat function open temporarily, um, just by giving me a thumbs up or the raise your hand function, um, how many people out there are currently using an occlusive dressing? Let's open this chat so I can see. So great, looks like we're getting a few thumbs up there at least, or we are. So thank you there for participating, it looks like. I'm sure there will be a lot more because I know it's kind of um, becoming more and more of a thing here. So secondarily, how many of you, again, by a show of hands or a thumbs up, are not using an occlusive dressing or currently have no experience using an occlusive dressing? And the thumbs up and raised hands continue to come in. So again, thank you for that participation. And then, you know, that probably doesn't um, cover everybody. So there's probably um, a group of people here for other reasons. Um, maybe you're just here to broaden that knowledge base, uh, which is also a great reason for joining these uh, webinars. My goal tonight is to tell you about my experience using Mepilex border post-op dressing and how it's changed my practice. My hope is that you'll have a better understanding of what the product is and what it has to offer. First, I'll tell you a, bit, a, little, a little bit about my experience using it in the operating room. Then I'll discuss a few studies related to infection and other complications. And finally, I'll show you that patients and providers are happier with this product than others. Moving forward, I will just be referring to the product as Mepilex or post-op. 
The full name as seen on my introductory slide is Mepilex Border Post-Op, um, and the shortened version is MBPO. Please note that much of my experience is in regards to the silver impregnated version of post-op. We use this specifically because we are performing high-risk procedures that involve an implant. So if you work in a specialty that does not involve those higher-risk procedures, um, then post-op dressing will work just fine. You'll see that it has many added benefits when compared to other dressings, even without the added benefit of silver. First, just a little bit about me to piggyback on Anna's introduction there. Um, I received my bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Northern Iowa. I then worked for a couple of years getting clinical experience before attending PA school at the University of Iowa. I've now been a PA for eight years and all of my experience is in orthopedics, mainly specializing in total joint replacement. I work in a practice with a total joint surgeon and uh, four other orthopedic surgeons, ranging from sports medicine to limb salvage. We have a sports surgeon, a joint surgeon, a foot and ankle specialist, as well as two orthopedic oncologists. Because of these different subspecialties, I see a wide variety of orthopedic issues. I work at Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. We are a 680 bed hospital with over 80 specialties. We are an urban medical center and therefore have a very diverse patient population. In addition to operating at the hospital, we try to do a large number of our total joints at our outpatient surgery center. Now these are same day discharges so we really try to take our younger, healthier patients to the surgery center. Ideally, all of our patients would be young enough and healthy enough to be done at the surgery center. But given our location, this is just not the case. A large portion of our primary total joints are very complex. We have a large patient population who have not had insurance for many years. Um, or who have had Medicaid and have had delays in their treatment for a very long time. We do around 300 primary total joints and about 100 revisions every year. Just like our primary total joints, our revisions tend to be more complex. We are a tertiary referral center and oftentimes seen as the last resort for patients in the metro area, around Colorado, as well as surrounding states. Now I mentioned that I hate complications and it's proven that the more surgeries you do, the more complications you're gonna have, but it's the preventable ones that bother me the most. And one of the most preventable complications are SSIs. The Center for Disease Control defines an SSI as an infection related to a surgical procedure and occurs 30 days after that procedure or 90 days, depending on if there is an implant in place. SSRIs, excuse me, SSIs, are the most common type of hospital-acquired infection, accounting for 20% of all hospital-acquired infections. I mentioned that we do high-risk procedures, and that's why we use the silver impregnated version of this dressing. Other examples of those high-risk surgeries include colorectal surgeries, any surgery with an organ transplant, joint replacement, major gynecological procedures, major general surgeries, as well as any type of cardiac surgery. Up to 60% of SSIs are preventable. Because of that, since 2008, the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has made SSI a primary target of institution's quality and control measures and a key pay for performance metric. The associated hard costs cited here aren't the only financial consequences faced by institutions caring for patients with SSIs. CMS no longer reimburses hospitals for HAIs like SSIs. In response, SSI prevention has become a critical objective for institutions nationwide. 
our hospital thought that those outcomes were important enough for us to start using post-op. And my experience with the dressing dates back to January of 2019. As previously mentioned, we were having wound complications, so we changed our entire closing technique from the suture to the dressing. We were previously using a deep PDS suture, followed by monocryl and then Dermabond skin glue. We would then apply a silver lawn dressing. We didn't really love the silver lawn dressing, so we were fine making that switch. During this process, we also tried um, multiple types of silver lawn dressing, as well as Aquacel and simple Xeroform gauze and Tegaderm dressing. We now use post-op on about 85% of our patients. The other 15% are our higher risk patients, which include obese patients, revisions, and infections. For those 15%, we're currently using a negative pressure wound therapy, uh, currently in the form of Provena. We trialed the product for about six weeks before officially switching. I think that six week trial is adequate. It gives um, providers as well as other members of the care team plenty of time to familiarize themselves with that product in the operating room. It also provides multiple opportunities to use to see that dressing post-operatively. Post-op really does have some cool technology. Uh, the SafeTac silicone contact layer is basically an adhesive gel that sticks when you want it to, but is also quite easy to remove. It has an absorbent foam pad. This foam pad may or may not contain silver, which acts as an antimicrobial agent. It has a non-woven and vapor permeable waterproof film. This allows patients to shower without the need to cover the dressing. The dressing is designed to absorb exudates, maintain a moist wound healing environment, and if with the addition of silver has antimicrobial properties. If there is silver in the dressing, those antimicrobial properties have been shown to be effective for up to seven days. And I'm sure that many of you here have cared, cared for a frail elderly patient in the hospital setting uh, where you're concerned about pressure wounds or skin tears. Post-op uses the same technology used to treat those types of problems and is therefore very gentle on the skin. It stretches with the skin, sticks well, and peels off in a manner that does not pull or tear the skin. So what happens when you invest the time and energy into implementing SSI prevention best practices in a, safe, in a culture of safety? Well, a lot of things happen. And the evidence shows that there is a reduction in SSIs, there are lower readmission rates, there is increased patient satisfaction, you have more positive clinical outcomes, you avoid unnecessary costs, and you optimize reimbursement. All of the reported outcomes were achieved by incorporating evidence-based products into evidence-based practice. This is the value of, of effective SSI prevention programs. This is just a comparison of that. Like I said, I have a lot of experience using the, the, the AG or the silver version. So really just comparing the two. And as you can see from the picture, at least, they're essentially the same dressing, just one contains silver ions and the other does not. These are the official instructions for use, uh, which can appear a bit wordy, but you can tell from the step-by-step -step pictorial that it's really a quite simple process. By abridged version with a few helpful tips. So steps one and two are the most obvious. First, you clean the wound, then you dry the skin. Step three, simply remove the middle portion of the backing, apply firmly to the skin, and then remove the other two portions of the release film. Now, because the SafeTac film is very thin, it does sometimes have a tendency to fold up on itself. So a couple key things to remember here. Um, 
I always try to remove that middle portion against resistance. So when I'm applying it in the operating room, I always set that down on the Mayo stand and pull that release film. Um, if you're gonna be applying this in the clinic, just be sure to set that either on the exam table or um, another table that you have there for assistance. Uh, when applying to the patient, you always wanna make sure that you do not either stretch the dressing or the skin. This is to prevent shearing forces, especially as that area swells. You wanna to try to avoid wrinkles as best you can. Uh, this will help to keep that dressing more water resistant over a longer period of time. And lastly, when applying to a body part that bends, such as the knee, you always wanna make sure that you apply inflection. Uh, again, this is to prevent shearing forces, uh, especially once that patient starts to go through range of motion or once they have swelling, you know, that can lead to blistering in the future. So here's just a quick video of the application process. So uh, as you can see here, I have that dressing placed against the Mayo stand, and I'm now holding on to that first release film, the center film. So pull against resistance. And then I can hold on to either side now with my glove without the dressing getting stuck to my gloves. In this case, I remove the shorter portion first. And that really, I just make an L shape with the palm of my hand and my thumb and slide down. And then as I remove that larger portion, I pull about one inch at a time, being sure that I release tension before I press to the skin. I then just go back up, make sure that the entirety of the dressing is firmly adhered to the skin to ensure water resistance. So a little less talking here, sorry. Remove that middle portion. And then again, that, that smaller one, you just essentially smooth over with the palm of your hand. And then as I go to that longer portion, I pull about one inch at a time and I pull, release, and then press. And it's really one fluid movement, but you just wanna make sure that you're releasing that tension before you're pressing it to the skin. As you can see here, uh, this is an anterior total hip, which is a much flatter surface. The dressing goes on essentially wrinkle-free in those instances. The other photo here is a total knee replacement. So because we apply that inflection, you will have some wrinkles and creases. And the, the biggest thing is that you just take your time when applying that dressing, really trying to minimize the number of wrinkles and creases that you do have. I'd mentioned that we changed our entire closing technique. So for those who are interested, we currently use a Stratifix um, number one symmetric PDS to close the arthrotomy. This layer uh, is closed with the surgeon as well as the PA. The following layers and also the application of the dressing are done by the PA alone. The subcutaneous layer is closed using a Stratifix 2O monocryl. On occasion, we'll run a subcuticular layer. This is done with a Stratifix 3O monocryl. The skin is then closed using Perneo Dermabond, which is a type of skin closure device that you'll see a, a picture um, later in my presentation. It's like a mesh film that um, has a liquid that basically turns that film uh, water resistant. And that's for our primaries. Our revisions, we use staples. And then lastly, the post-op dressing is applied followed by a compressive ACE wrap. I will just go over a few studies related to occlusive dressings, some of which contain silver, some that don't. So this study published in the Journal of Arthroplasty compared silver impregnated dressings with xeriform and gauze. So it took a total of 834 patients and about 63% of those received the xeriform dressing and about 37% received the silver dressing. Uh, the group that received that silver impregnated dressing had a 50% reduction in infection. 
So the 3.9% here compared to that 8.4%. Another telling statistic here is the percentage of deep infection. 0% in the silver group compared to that of about 23 in the um, non-silver group, which is right around the national average of 1% to 2%. This meta-analysis compared multiple different types of dressings, including wound vax, hydrocolloids, foams, films, and fabrics, gauze, as well as antimicrobial dressings. And it found that the optimal type of dressing to reduce blisters, as well as periprosthetic joint infection, was the antimicrobial dressing. We have an active aging population and an aging active population. In 2017, there were more than 754,000 total knee replacements performed in the United States. And there were more than 450,000 total hip replacements done. By 2030, it is projected that there will be more than 1.9 million total knees done every year and over 850,000 total hips done in the United States annually. And as, those, as the number of those total joints increases, so will the number of complications associated with those surgeries. And one of the most expensive complications is infection. Approximately 1% to 2% of all patients undergoing a total joint replacement will go on to develop a periprosthetic joint infection, also known as a PJI. The cost of treating a PJI is substantial and estimated to be $1.85 billion by 2030. The average cost of a single total knee PJI is just over $28,000, and the average cost of a single total hip PJI is just north of 32,000. Please keep in mind these are United States statistics and uh, they are likely much different than those in Canada. PJI is estimated to be responsible for about 15% of all total hip revisions and as high as 25% of all total knee revisions. It also has an associated a uh, five-year mortality rate higher than that of breast cancer, melanoma, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. While these monetary values are striking, they do not take into account the significant physical and emotional costs to patients and providers. However, it's the numbers that matter most for hospitals and clinics. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, it's very difficult to get anything approved for use unless you can show that you're saving the healthcare facility money. Using occlusive dressings decreases infections and therefore decreases cost. And now that it's funny because it's true slide and a quote from uh, the one and only Dr. Mark Tuttle, who is my attending physician. Orthopedic surgeons use studies like a drunk uses a lamppost for support, not illumination. Now, if you don't work in orthopedics or you don't happen to know an orthopedic surgeon, maybe you don't find this funny, uh, but it's obviously meant to be a joke. Joking aside, it's absolutely important that we all practice evidence-based medicine. But we have to keep in mind that studies within, studies within orthopedics are not like other specialties. It's difficult, if not impossible, to perform randomized control trials with large populations of orthopedic patients. Because of that, when making my decision to switch to post-op, the science was very important, but honestly, the deciding factors were the overall user experience and how that dressing performed post-operatively. Objectively, it meets the requirements needed to justify its cost to the hospital. Subjectively, it outperforms other dressings on the market. As previously mentioned, I've tried several other types of silver um, impregnated occlusive dressings, including Silverlon, Aquacel, and Xeriform and Tegaderm. I've seen significantly less unwanted side effects with the post-op than others. Post-op seems to absorb more exudates before losing its water-resistant seal. 
We've experienced significantly less blistering since making the switch. It's easier to apply in the operating room and it stays in place for longer periods of time. While the instructions for use say that it is safe to leave on for up to seven days or proven effective for up to seven days, we advise all of our patients to leave that dressing on for two weeks. It does not interfere with zipline or perneo derma bond. And overall, we've just had better outcomes as well as better experience with the addition of post-op. Now, these are all subjective anecdotal experiences from our practice. We have not had time to do a study to prove these, but someone did, um, and it was published in the American Journal of Orthopedics. That study compared 300 patients undergoing identical orthopedic procedures with identical closing techniques. One group received an occlusive antimicrobial dressing and the other a standard surgical dressing. It found that the complications, including blistering, were significantly reduced. It also found that the number of dressing changes um, in the occlusive group were reduced. And it found that patient satisfaction, as well as perception of sterility, were significantly higher in the occlusive dressing group than that of the standard group. Our patients have also been happier since making the switch. Here's one of our happy customers who is also the best cat dad ever. Um, they like the fact that there are no dressing changes required that there is no need to uh, cover the dressing when they shower, and that it does not inhibit their range of motion. We've seen very few allergic reactions, though I cannot say that we've seen none. I swear we have some patients who are allergic to everything who have either reacted to the silver component or the adhesive component, but I can probably think of five off the top of my head, so very few. Now, patients are typically very apprehensive about removing any post-operative dressing, let alone one that's been on for two weeks. But I will say that removal of post-op is relatively pain-free. Here's just a quick video of Dr. Tuttle removing the dressing. And yes, our patient is the one doing the recording here. Um, and please forgive Dr. Tuttle for not wearing gloves when he's removing this dressing. But you can see here, he just basically pulls and rolls into kind of a cigar rolling fashion. This is the perneo dermabond that I was telling you about. So, you know, if there's ever concern that the dressing is gonna stick to the skin closure device, I mean, we have so much experience and proof right here that um, it really does not stick to that and it doesn't pull that off when you remove the dressing. photo here on the left is a two-week total hip, and the photo on the right is a two-week total knee. As I had mentioned, we prefer to leave that intraoperative dressing on for a full two weeks, and I'd say that the majority of the time that happens. So each of these dressings was applied in the operating room. Um, neither of the patients changed their dressing, and both of them took several showers prior to their two-week post-op visit. Please remember that Malika does not endorse leaving that dressing on for a full 14 days. However, I can confidently say that it is okay to do so. Now, if you're concerned about this, you can always send the patient home with a second dressing, have them change after seven days, or honestly, you can just probably have them leave the dressing off and the incision uncovered at that point. Just a few more post-op photos here. So two week total hip with dressing in place. And then after the dressing has been removed, the, the perneo has also been removed from that incision. Same thing here with a two week total knee. So again, you will have some more wrinkles and creases, but as long as those creases pinch or fold up on themselves, then the dressing remains water resistant. And then once dressing as well as perneo has been removed. So again, some of this has been talking about the um, 
silver version and a lot of it with just the post-op version, but they are literally the exact same dressing um, minus the fact that the post-op AG has silver ions, but you'll get all the other benefits with just the standard post-op dressing. Post-op is easy to apply in the operating room. It has less associated complications than other dressings. And patients and providers are happier with this product than others. So let me leave you with this. I have experience using multiple different types of silver impregnated dressings. And I found that Mepilex Border Post-Op Dressing is the best product on the market. I invite you to try it for yourself so that you too can see how great it is. Thank you very much for your time and attention. What questions do you guys have? Thank you, Charlie. We are now going to begin answering questions. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A box. I have a question here for you, Charlie, from our, from our audience. Uh, okay. Have you noticed a difference in the look of the incision lines? If yes, have your colleagues also noticed? Yeah, so overall, I think that our incisions have, uh, we have had improved outcomes with our incision. It's hard to say that, you know, all of that credit goes to um, the post-op dressing because we did change a lot of things when we when we incorporated the post-op dressing. But again, that's kind of how med medicine works, right? You like make these minor changes until you get the, the perfect result that you that you're intending. And so overall, I would say that, yes, with the addition of post-op, um, we're, we're much happier with, with our incisions appearance, um, as well as, um, you know, they're healing a lot better and not getting nearly as many um, spitting sutures and, and superficial infections. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here. What's the biggest change you have noticed using this dressing on patients? Yeah, I think I think the patients in general, they like the fact that they don't have to change the dressing. Um, you know, it's it's nice for patients to just they feel more comfortable that that dressing was applied in a sterile environment and that they don't have to look at the incision. A lot of patients, you know, have apprehension about what that incision looks like. So I think just overall, patients are a lot a lot happier that they don't have to change the dressing. Um, when we were using Silverlon and Aquacell, they very rarely made it to that two-week uh, post-op visit, whereas I would say the majority of the post-op dressings are still in place and water-resistant by the time we see them at two weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming up. Are all Maplex dressing waterproof? So I, I am very careful when I say that use the term waterproof and water resistant. So mm -hmm. I, I never want to tell a patient that the dressing is waterproof because to me that means that they can soak in a bathtub, hot tub, swimming pool, which is not the case. So yes, the Mepilex post-op dressing as well as the Mepilex post-op AG dressing are both water resistant, which means that they can shower um, without the worry that it will lose its water resistance seal. Okay, thank you. Um, another question coming up here. In a long-term care setting, would you recommend this dressing type in other types of wounds or it made this specific for post-op incisions? So I think this specific dressing is made for post-op incisions. I think if you were in a setting where you needed something to be applied, then it would work just fine. But the, um, you know, Munlika has several other dressings on the market that are specifically for those types of dressings or, or those issues that I can't really speak much about, but I'm sure the mm -hmm. other members uh, of the Munlika team here can. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, we have more questions coming up, which is great. We have a very engaging audience tonight. Um, would you recommend no stink skin preparation application around the wound before placing the Metlex border? 
on wound for better seeking propose or not? I would not recommend that. <clears throat> and it's not, it's also not in the um, instructions for use, but sometimes obviously as care providers, we do things against the IFUs. But my concern with that skin prep, such as like mastosol or something, you know, that the dressing sticks so well without it. I'd be concerned that if you put that on in addition to the um, the safe tack uh, adhesive, that then you really might be causing more harm than good with that. So I would advise against that. But Okay. Okay. Thank you for your insight. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, is it common to have noticeable exudate on the dressing when it's recommended to change if it's the case? Yeah, and that's a good question. And so that's, again, with part of the presentation and just my experience using the different types of dressings, we found that the, the post-op dressing does absorb significantly more exudate, which number one is really good. Um, another great thing about post-op is it has that clear window. So you can, you can truly see whether or not there is exudate. It's typically recommended and everybody's going to have different thresholds, but if, if the exudate is hitting three, three or more sides of that dressing, then, then that's time that it should change. So um, I think there's a, a, yeah. So basically if it's hitting, you know, two of those long sides and one of the shorter sides, then it needs to be changed. Honestly, if I see somebody's dressing post-op day one, when I'm rounding on them in the hospital, if there's mm -hmm. even just a little bit of, of exudate, a lot of times I'll just change it because then it, it eliminates that, you know, is it getting worse? question because you know they go home with a, a perfectly clean dressing okay great thank you uh we have one more interesting question here i want to try this dressing at my facility what sold you on using this dressing over others mm -hmm. yeah and that's a that's a good question and that's where i think you know all facilities are different um especially those in Canada compared to those in the United States. Um, so it's going to be, I think, different for you guys, but it's important to, again, number one, show that the evidence backs the product um, because hospitals and clinics need to see that. Um, the cost is going to be very important. And if you can show that you decrease infection and therefore decrease cost, that's also important. And then a, a really big thing that we had is a uh, physician champion. So, um, you know, we started using this product and um, I told Dr. Tuttle about it and how much I liked it. And he was all for trying it. And once he started seeing the results and using it in the operating room, he was all for it. And so when you have, you know, a physician champion or a surgeon who is willing to go to the, you know, the purchasing team at the hospital and tell them that this is a, a must have in all of our surgeries, then they tend to listen. So. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, I believe we have covered all the questions from our audience. Um, oh, we have one more. <laughs> um, in regards to dressing chains and patient comfort, have your patients comment on less pain compared to other dressings? Yeah, so, and, and I think that goes to the fact that um, it's about whatever the patients and providers are used to, right? So um, I initially, when I first started practicing eight years ago, worked for a total joint surgeon who required us to change the dressing of every single patient before they left the hospital. So, you know, we, we applied a dressing sterilely in the operating room, and now we're taking that off and using non-sterile gloves, and, and they're in a, in a hospital room that's full of bacteria, and then we're putting on a new dressing. And so I think first and foremost, you have to just change the way that you're used to always doing something. And then once you have experience with that, and you can reassure your patients and other providers that you've had great outcomes doing it this way, then, then yeah, they all, they all get on board relatively quickly. Um, and then on the opposite side of that, again, a lot of patients, they just don't want to mess with dressing changes at all. 
Um, it saves so many questions in our clinic, um, so many calls from patients where it's just like, yep, that dressing's on. If it loses its seal, change it. If not, don't mess with it. So. That's great. Thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, so thank you, Charlie, for your engaging talk. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Make Legs Border Tools Off, Using a Total Joint Practice. If you have any other questions, please contact Wounds Canada at info at woundscanada.ca. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on this presentation, and we would appreciate if you complete to provide us your feedback. You also have an opportunity to sign up for future updates from Monica. You also receive a follow-up email with a link to view the recording of today's webinar from Wounds Canada. Please email info at .ca at monlica.com to request your certificate of attendance. On behalf of Charlie, Monica, and Wounds Canada, thank you for joining us today and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much, everyone.